So I just wanted to talk a little bit again about the difference between speech and voice. So speech is, carries the content of what we want to say. It's the, um, the sounds made by the lips, tongue and teeth in order to form words, vowels, consonants. Speech conveys meanings, thoughts and ideas. Speech carries is what is carrying different accents uh, because it's the, the way that we make vowels and consonants. Different languages have different sound systems and rules for using them. And so speech and accent are intimately related. And interestingly, as Dan said, we can speak without a true voice, without a, a laryngeal voice. So we have that artificial larynx, the buzzer that we can put on the throat, articulate the sounds, and we're still speaking. Um, and we know there are artificial voices developed um, to be used through machines as well. The voice itself is the vehicle for speech, the vehicle for emotion. It's the sound made by the larynx and modified <coughs> by the vocal tract, the part above the larynx. It's the vehicle for speech and for singing, conveys emotions and feelings, and also invokes feelings and emotions in other people. It reveals aspects of our personality, and it's quite unique to each of us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about different factors that affect voice. We've talked a bit about the, the voice being a physical system, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But there are lots of factors that play into the voice and how it works. So one of them is medical, and Daniel's covered a lot of that. Physical, physical health, psychological aspects. The environment can affect the way the voice works. Vocal load, and then vocal technique. So if we start, I'm just going to say medically, if you have a voice disorder that lasts longer than a couple of weeks, do go and see an ENT. If you have pain, if you find you're coughing up blood, if you have difficulty swallowing, feeling of a lump in the throat or severe voice loss or voice change, make sure you go and check it out. It could be something quite serious. Better to get that checked out and also that way you can be directed for help. So once you see your ENT, you'll hopefully get a diagnosis, but sometimes that may take a little while may lead to more testing before you can ultimately do that. Once it's been worked out what the cause of the problem is, you can possibly have medical treatment if that's appropriate. You may be referred for speech pathology and there are some other alternative treatment modalities which might be of assistance. So, speech pathology. Why do you need to come to speech pathology if you've got a problem with your voice? Because we know how to talk. Most of us our, content, our contact with speech pathologists is through either our own children or our neighbour's children or our grandchildren who have gone to speech pathology because they're having trouble making their sounds or they're having problems with learning at school. But speech pathologists can also contribute significantly in voice. So we can be involved in uh, assessment of the voice which can help with diagnosis of the voice problem, working out which part of the system is not working too well. We can be involved in education as to how the voice works and how it can go wrong. We can be involved in re-education, training of the voice, improving vocal techniques to maximise the vocal efficiency. We can be involved in helping you to develop strategies to manage the situations that arise when you're struggling to produce a good voice. Some strategies to perhaps manage the other people because communication is a two-way thing. It's not only the speaker that's responsible to communicate, it's also the listener. And so sometimes we have to work out how can we manage the listener as well. Um, and uh, speech pathology can also help to uh, compensate or supplement the current vocal skills that you're living with. <coughs> and finally, we can provide ongoing support and encouragement and perhaps some uh, redirection to other things that might be helpful. So I'm going to look first here at um, the physical and psychological aspects. So if we look at how does the voice work, Dan's already referred to that system of an energy source, the breathing, a vibrator, the vocal folds, 
and a channel or a resonator, which is the area above the larynx, in the pharynx, and up into the oral cavity as well, which are responsible for making sounds, but also changing the quality and the power of the voice. Changing the resonance of the voice can give you more power uh, without effort. So if something goes wrong with any part of that system, or if there's poor coordination between different parts of the system, then something can go wrong with the voice. The, um, the vocal folds themselves, they make a buzzing sound. They're able to open and close. They're able to lengthen and shorten to change pitch, but they can't vibrate themselves. <coughs> they respond to the air that comes up between them and sets the edges vibrating. And you saw in that beautiful video that Dan showed, that wonderful wave-like motion. They can't do it on their own. So the breath is very, very important um, in creating a, a source of energy to get those vocal folds to vibrate. What can affect the voice? Fatigue, dehydration, stress, excessive tension in the tongue, the neck, the throat, the shoulders. I'm glad to see a little bit of tongue stretch there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, things that cause problem with breathing uh, can cause problems with voice. Poor posture, overuse, using it too much, too loudly with poor technique or inadequate technique for what you're doing, and then problems with the vocal cords themselves. So our diet can be very important. Well, first of all, can I say don't smoke? Smoke goes directly into... So the... the um, the voice is part of the respiratory system. Smoke is going directly across the vocal folds, through the pharynx, down into the lungs. Not good for the lungs, not good for general health, not good for the vocal folds because it can cause swelling, inflammation, stiffening of the cords, all of which contribute to a terrible voice. Um, and then just in terms of um, general Ill health, Ill health, we know that it's strongly related to cancer. So that's my big first don't. Um, looking after our diet is important. It's important that we remain healthy. The voice is a part of our whole body. It doesn't exist in isolation. It's a set of muscles and cartilages that hang in our neck. Um, those muscles respond to exactly the same things that the rest of our body responds to. If we are unwell, it's hard to have energy to move around. It's hard to do things well. It's hard to coordinate. So it's hard to do those same things with our vocal system. So it's important to stay well. <coughs> we need to manage reflux, and Dan mentioned that reflux is quite a significant factor in um, hoarseness, in, particularly in singers. Um, and so we need to, we can do that by managing diet, watching what we eat, avoiding the things that we know trigger reflux. Um, and Dan had referred to those, so fatty, oily foods, t uh, coffee and tea, anything with caffeine carbonated drinks, um, spicy foods, and um, acidic foods can all contribute. They act to um, relax the sphincter at the top of the stomach, which means you're more likely to get reflux. And then there are mechanical aspects as well. Anything that presses on the belly, so tight clothes, bending at the waist, um, those kind of things, eating too much, it's going to be more likely to cause acidic stomach contents to come up into the esophagus and then potentially up into the throat. So we want to be careful of what we wear, eat small, mo small meals rather than large ones, um, and uh, be careful bending. If you need to bend, much better for a variety of reasons, but at least for reflux, better to bend like this so that you're not bending at the waist rather than bending here and squashing the belly. And then the other thing to remember is that it's uh, good to eat two or three hours before you lie down. If you have your stomach contents acidic because they're busy digesting what you've put in them, and then you lie down, your head's lower than your stomach, you're more likely to have a little stream of acid trickling up into the throat. That can lead to soreness of the throat in the morning and irritation. Um, and one of the ways that you can also um, assist in that is to raise the head of the bed slightly. It only needs to be a few inches. You can do it with a couple of phone books under the bed. 
You can buy foam wedges um, to put on your bed. Some people find just a couple of pillows helpful, but you've just got to be careful of your neck in that situation. <laughs> um, so we just want to have that little bit of an angle so any acid's got to go uphill rather than down. Um, drinking in moderation, um, again, for a variety of reasons. Hydration's really important. There's quite a lot of evidence in the literature that hydrated vocal folds work more efficiently than dry ones. Um, they require less effort to start vibration um, and um, you can have uh, there's two different sorts of, of hydration, so systemic hydration is really important. We need about one and a half to two litres a day because we want to produce thin runny mucus that covers the vocal folds. The vocal folds are beating together 100 times a, a minute for men, 200 for women, second, second sorry. 100 times a second, 200 times a second, they won't adjust too much, they don't want to stick. And when they're hydrated, they're less sticky, so easier to get going and less ethical. Um, interestingly, if you're a, a karaoke singer, uh, there was evidence in one paper in the Journal of Voice in 2003 that suggests that hydration and vocal rest are useful strategies to preserve voice function and quality during karaoke singing. <laughs> so, hydr yeah, useful bit to know. Um, hydrated vocal folds need lower lung pressure, so less effort. Surface hydration just refers to um, how you get moisture into the, the vocal tract directly. Again, it just um, helps with, with temporary hydration, more comfort. Steaming, inhaling steam is one of the best ways to do that. You're just inhaling warm, moist air, which is absorbed um, into the vocal tract. Um, when you swallow, nothing's getting onto your larynx if you've got an efficient system or you would drown. So that inhalation though allows moisture to be absorbed by those tissues. Uh, sleep's important. Sleep disorders can affect both our motor reflex and coordination. It can reduce our resistance to stress um, and can generate depression and anxiety. So making sure that we have enough sleep is important. Exercise, good for general health, so therefore good for the voice. We also need to recognise our emotional state and address it. So the emotions can affect the voice in lots of ways. It can affect our volume or intonation. We know that when someone is feeling low, feeling depressed, we can recognise from how they look They'll generally be a little more internal, but vocally they will also be more internal. They'll have a lower volume and their intonation will tend to be flat. The general mood and, and emotions can affect um, our energy level. If we're again feeling low, we're going to have less energy. If we're anxious, we're going to use more energy in everything we do, so we're going to fatigue more easily. Our emotional state can affect our breathing. So I've already talked about how important breathing is in order to generate voice. If our breathing's not efficient, we're not going to efficiently drive that voice. So um, anxiety in particular can cause us almost to hold the breath. It makes us hold our whole body ready to either hit or run, that fight or flight reaction. And in doing that, we hold the breath back as well. That means we don't have sufficient energy to drive the voice. We're more likely to compensate by using the muscles of the neck and throat to try to produce some sound. The other thing about um, stress and anxiety is that it tends to encourage us to breathe quite high. And when we do that, again, we're inducing tension into the muscles of the neck and throat and shoulders. And you can hear that by breathing in that way, I'm changing the sound of my voice. You can hear that I sound quite anxious, and now, because I'm doing that, I'm feeling quite anxious. So, the feelings change the physical reaction. If that physical reaction is maintained, it perpetuates the feelings. And if we can break that cycle by inter intervening and controlling that physical reaction, it can also help us to control the emotional feelings that we're, we're um, experiencing as well. Again, our emotional state can affect our overall tension in our body. 
um, and particularly in the neck, throat and shoulders. Um, these can all affect laryngeal posture and voice production. And then uh, emotional um, things can affect other aspects of our health as well. They can uh, contribute towards gut problems, so for example reflux and irritable bowel syndrome um, and things like skin problems as well. And then functional voice disorders because of the tension here. Once that tightens up quite a lot, it's very hard to get the voice out. So, important that we address that. Mackenzie, Miller, Wilson, Sellers and Deary in um, the British Medical Journal in 2001 um, said that many patients with vocal dysfunction enter a vicious cycle in which psychological factors exacerbate voice pathology but poor voice quality adversely affects psychological well-being. So it's a two-way street. The way we're feeling can affect the way we use our voice but when we're having problems using our voice, it very much affects the way we feel. So we need to look after our physical and mental health. And there are a lot of different things that can be very helpful um, in dealing with that. Um, they're not going to cure a voice disorder, but they can certainly address some of the factors that influence how easy it is to use your voice and how you're feeling. Um, about yourself generally. Relaxation is, is one part, one way. Um, so there are a number of different relaxation techniques. There are various tapes that you can purchase that are helpful. And relaxation doesn't mean <coughs> you're sitting down and turn the telly on. Um, but it's actually a conscious <coughs> taking of yourself away from the normal situation and focusing your, on your body in a way that enables you to relax the muscles. So one way of doing that is visualisation, uh, visualising a situation in which you feel that you're able to relax. For some people it's floating on water. If you can't swim that might not be very relaxing. <laughs> For other people it might be lying on a beach. Whatever floats your boat, so to speak. But So visualising encourages you to imagine and really get into that zone and then feel that your whole body gradually responds to that visualisation experience. The other way is a more physical approach of consciously contracting and then releasing muscles throughout the body. By contracting the muscles, first of all, it raises your awareness of tension in them and then you're able to consciously let that go. So you can do it right throughout the body. When you start, it's best to do it lying down. But you do get to a point where you can control that to a point that you can do it while you're standing up. You can aim at different parts of your body and you can do it quite efficiently and quickly. So you can start with just the forehead, raising and then releasing. And by uh, doing the tensing as you breathe in and the release as you breathe out, you can also incorporate some visualisation because you can... Um, sense that tension, leave your body as the breath leaves. There are various stress reduction techniques, so relaxation I've already mentioned. Um, abdominal breathing techniques can be very helpful at releasing stress. Exercise is important um, for stress management. Um, adequate rest I've mentioned. Managing your time so you don't try and squeeze too much into a day and create extra pressure for yourself. Time management can be a very important thing. Um, and then also making sure that you fit into your day things that you love to do, not only the things that you have to do. So balancing those two things. There are, uh, so for some people it might be quite difficult to manage um, strong emotions on their own. Um, and it can be quite helpful to see someone who's qualified who can talk through issues with you um, and help you to manage the emotions um, effectively and so there are people like psychologists, qualified psychologists, uh, counsellors and psychotherapists that can be very useful. Sometimes just in the short term there might be some situation that arises that is just overwhelming at the time, you're not able to deal with it yourself, going and talking to someone qualified um, and who is skilled to help you can uh, be a great resource. Meditation and mindfulness can be quite helpful as well, learning to live in the present um, and, um, and just be focused on that rather than 
worrying about all the external things that can be happening in your life. And then there is some um, activity-based, activity and mind-based um, techniques, I guess. So most of us know about yoga. Uh, yoga focuses very much on posture and breathing, both important to voice, very helpful for general relaxation. Um, and so it, it, for many people, uh, it can be a, an excellent way of uh, building general body, bodily strength and flexibility, but also a more centred approach to daily life. The Feldenkrais method is perhaps less well known, and it facilitates learning through lessons that explore movement, posture and breathing. Um, it uses the brain's natural ability to change in response to sensory input. It's very much focused on uh, increasing your awareness of what your body's doing and making small changes in response to that increased awareness. Um, and it can lead to um, a way of living that's less effortful, less tense, um, and... Um, it contributes to better health generally, improved attention, they claim improved thinking ability, so I should start that. Um, improved emotional resilience, better posture, better movement, coordination and balance, easier ways of doing tasks, and uh, they also um, have some success in reducing pain um, in various muscle groups and control over muscle tension, also very important for the voice. The Alexander Technique is another sort of mind-body technique which uh, may or may not be known to you. Um, so it's a method that works, again, to change movement habits in everyday activities. Um, it's a simple and practical <coughs> method for improving ease and freedom of movement. Again, focusing very much on posture and balance, um, support and coordination. And it's teaching the appropriate amount of effort for an appropriate task so that you're not doing everything with your whole body but if you need to lift a glass of water you use that arm you don't use everything and waste energy next thing we're going to have a look at quickly are environmental issues so um, very simple Background noise is the most significant um, environmental issue mm -hmm. for someone with a voice problem, right? And where can you go that's quiet these days? So when you're talking about perhaps lobbying or activating for change, creating more voice-friendly and hearing-friendly environments would be a good one. So reducing background noise is an easy thing to say, not always easy to do, particularly outside, but you can start at home. Make sure the television's off when you try and talk to someone. And you may need to talk to your family members about that and emphasise how important that is. Having the radio on in the background can be very pleasant, but not great if you're going to have a conversation. So trying to identify what are the things that you can change in your background so that it's much easier for you to communicate. Um, reducing irritants, so bodies respond to it various irritants, they, they differ for different people. Some people are very uh, reactive to perfumes, some to cleaning agents, some to flowers and pollens, some to grasses. This time of year can be a disaster for some people, everything inside swells up, so then that's going to affect the voice. So if you can reduce those irritants, um, it's, it's good to do that. Um, also limiting your exposure to mould and pollutants. So if we look at vocal load, so vocal load is really how much do you use your voice and how loudly do you use it and then do you have the technique that enables you to do that. So, I don't know how this is going to work. Oh no, it's not right. Okay, that little bar should swivel but it's not going to. I thought I was very clever. Okay, so what are some strategies that we can use to limit voice use? Well, first of all, don't waste your voice on trying to get people's attention. If you need to get a group of people from outside, you're not going to call out. You want to save your voice for what it's needed for. So it might be handy to have a whistle 
might be handy, just clap your hands. Every teacher should have some strategies for getting attention without having to raise the voice and call out. At home, if you've got someone at one end of the house and you want them, calling out's not going to be helpful. By the time you've got them, you've got no voice left, so you've wasted your opportunity. So thinking of ways that you can minimise that activity so that you can use your voice for what you need. Um, sometimes simple things like using email or texting instead of trying to talk on the phone when you don't need to. Phones are notoriously difficult and I think mobile phones are even worse than the old fashioned ones. It's very much harder to get any sense of whether you're being heard over a mobile phone and we use our mobile phones in such extraordinary places in the main street with a bus going down, um, in a noisy restaurant, on a bus, when you could only use a phone booth, you're kind of already insulated, but with a mobile it gives us a lot of flexibility but also a lot of noisy environments to work in. So texting for a short message may be much, much more useful <coughs> and then save your voice for a proper conversation.